The femur is the longest and heaviest bone in the body. It transmits body weight from the hip bone to the tibia when a person is standing. Its length is approximately a quarter of the person's height. The femur consists of the shaft, which is the body, and the two ends, the proximal and distal ends of the femur. Let's first talk about the proximal end of the femur, or also known as the superior end. The proximal end of the femur consists of the head, neck, and two trochanters, the greater trochanter and the lesser trochanter. The head of the femur is round, and it articulates with the acetabulum of the pelvis to form the hip joint. The femoral head is covered with articular cartilage, except for a medially placed depression or pit, the fovea, for the ligament of the head. In early life, the ligament gives passage to an artery, supplying the epiphysis of the head. The neck of the femur connects the head of the femur with the shaft. The neck of the femur is a common site for fractures. The intratrochanteric line is a site where the neck and the shaft join. It is a roughened ridge formed by the attachment of a powerful ligament, the iliofemoral ligament. Now focusing on the shaft of the femur. The shaft of the femur descends in a slight medial direction, and this brings the knees closer to the body's center of gravity, increasing stability. Some clinical anatomy, fractures of the femur. Despite its large size and strength, the femur is commonly fractured, and the most common fractures include the neck of the femur, intertrochanteric fractures, and shaft fractures. The neck of the femur is the most common site for fractures because it is the narrowest and weakest part of the bone. The most common cause of fractures is trauma, usually. And a major risk factor is osteoporosis, which is the weakening of the bones, and this makes it more prone to fractures. Now, talking about the distal end of the femur. Here you find what's called the medial and lateral condyles. The femoral condyles articulate with the menisci, which is cartilage and the tibial condyles themselves to form what's called the knee joint. The medial and lateral epicondyles, epi as in above, the epicondyles provide proximal attachment for the medial and lateral collateral ligaments of the knee joint. Then you have the intercondylar fossa and the patella surface. Now the condyles themselves are separated posteriorly and inferiorly by an intercondylar fossa, but merge anteriorly when you look at the front, it merges forming a depression called the patella surface. And this surface is what articulates with the patella bone. The intercondylar fossa contains two facets for the attachment of the intracapsular knee ligaments, the anterior cruciate ligament, ACL, and the posterior cruciate ligament, PCL. Now going back to the proximal end of the femur, the proximal femur is bent in an L-shaped so that the long axis of the head and neck projects superomedially at an angle to that of an obliquely oriented shaft. This obtuse angle of inclination is greatest most nearly straight at birth, and then it gradually diminishes, becomes more acute until adulthood. And the angle that is reached on average is about 126 degrees. The angle of inclination also increases with age, and this also contributes to the increased risk of fracture. However, in females, the angle of inclination is less, and this is because of the increased width 
between the acetabula and the greater oblique orientation of the femoral shaft. The angle of inclination allows greater mobility of the femur at the hip joint. Some clinical anatomy, coxavara and coxavalga. Now the angle of inclination between the long axis of the femoral neck and the femoral shaft, it varies with age, sex, and development of the femur. When the angle of inclination is decreased, the condition is coxavara. When it is increased, it is known as coxavalga. Vara is a Latin term which describes any bone or joint that is deformed in such a way that its distal element is deviated towards midline. So in coxavara, there is increased joint stability due to increased coverage of the femoral head in the acetabulum people will tend to have knocked knees. So the knees are brought together. The term valga is used when the distal elements deviates away from the midline. So people will have what's called bow legs. So the knees are quite separated. Angle of declination. Now, when the femur is viewed from the top, so superiorly, you're looking um, down at the shaft and the head here. It is apparent that the two axis lies at an angle. And this is the torsion angle or angle of declination. The average in males is about 7 degrees and in females is 12 degrees. When you have antiversion, excessive antiversion, this is an increase in the angle of the femoral torsion while a decrease in the angle of femoral torsion is known as retroversion. Now these changes the biomechanics of walking and standing as depicted by the foot stance in this image. So you can see in these images with excessive antiversion, the foot will be medial stance and in retroversion, the foot will be in an external stance. Now let's briefly talk about the blood supply of the femur. The femoral artery, which is a continuation of the external iliac artery, constitutes the major blood supply to the lower limb. The femoral artery gives off profunda femoris, a branch below the inguinal ligament, and becomes also the other, the superficial femoral artery. The superficial femoral artery ends as it passes through the adductor hiatus in adductor magnus to continue as a popliteal artery. Blood supply of the neck and head of femur is a bit more complicated. The majority of blood supply to the head and neck of the femur comes from the medial and lateral circumflex branches of the profunda femoris, so the deep femoral artery. The medial and lateral circumflex femoral arteries anastomose to form a ring around the neck of the femur. And from here, you have small arteries branching off to perfuse the femoral head. Now, this is the main blood supply for the femoral head. Another direct source of supply to the femoral head is from the foveal artery, which only occurs in the pediatric population because eventually this is replaced by the ligamentum teres, as we have learned earlier. The ligamentum teres is the ligament connecting the head of the femur to the acetabulum. Now, there are two important anastomoses that provide collateral blood flow in, to support the femoral head. One is the cruciate anastomosis, which is between the inferior gluteal artery and the medial circumflex femoral artery. And the other is the trochanteric anastomosis, which is between the superior gluteal artery and the medial and lateral circumflex femoral arteries. Some clinical anatomy, avascular necrosis of the femoral head. Avascular necrosis or osteonecrosis of the femoral head is characterized by bone cell death that follows an impairment of blood flow to the bone. And this could be due to a traumatic or non-traumatic cause. As we have learned, the blood vessels supplying the femoral head 
rely on small arteries with limited collateral blood flow. So in summary, in this video we discussed the anatomy of the femur and its blood supply. The femur is divided into the proximal, shaft, and distal segments. The proximal femur is a common site for femoral fractures. The angle of inclination is an obtuse angle between the long axis of the femoral neck and femoral shaft, averaging an adult of 126 degrees. Abnormality in the angle can lead to coxa vara and or coxa valga. Thank you for watching.